Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Mick, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And I want to thank you and Renee Heath and everyone else here at the University of Portland who brought me here. It's really a, a pleasure to be here, uh, both at this university and in this city. And uh, tonight what I want to do, if it's okay, is give a talk that you will be the really the first people to hear. And you know, usually if you think you get someone gives a talk, they package up something they've been giving 75 times before. But we're in very unique times right now in the United States. Uh, the economic meltdown, uh, the depression, frankly, that we're in now, uh, looks to be the defining moment of all um, our lives. And I suspect for the students at the University of Portland, the period we're entering right now will pretty much define your lives, much like the Great Depression or World War II defined your great-grandparents or grandparents' lives or my parents' lives. Uh, uh, that's the type of moment we're in. And in the middle of this crisis we're in, both political and economic, um, there's a crisis right now in journalism that's part of it that is every bit as important um, as the crisis of the economy. They go hand in hand, but they're distinct, and it's every bit as important. So what I want to do tonight is talk about that crisis, how to understand it, and what we can and must do uh, in the coming months and years uh, to address it and the peril we face if we do not, and the peril is severe. First of all, and I think many of you are familiar with this, we're in the midst right now of extraordinary uh, cutbacks in journalism, in traditional journalism as we know it. Uh, in the past year, roughly 16,000 journalists, paid journalists, working journalists in the United States with daily newspapers have lost their jobs. We're down to roughly 50,000 today. Uh, to 60,000, excuse me, and it's expected that we'll lose at least that many, if not more, this year. Um, the number of people who are paid to do journalism today in the United States, or by the end of this year, to even be more graphic, who are paid to do journalism by the end of this year in the United States will be a small fraction of the number 25 or 30 years ago. But our population has increased, the amount of news that we need uh, has increased. Uh, it's a severe problem. Newspapers, daily newspapers are closing down. It's almost a daily occurrence to see something in the news now about our newspaper that's considering closing or cutting back. Uh, again, this is unprecedented in American history. We've never been in a situation with newspapers closing routinely uh, where we're going to have areas in our country with no working journalists covering them any longer. Uh, communities are voting on public office where there'll be no political information upon which citizens will be able to vote. As bad as the closings are, as bad as the layoffs are of journalists, uh, newspapers that are closing, are just that those newspapers that are attempting to survive, those newsrooms that are attempting to survive, to do so are following the logic of cutting back, uh, reducing the number of workers they have, closing down bureaus, uh, so that what they have to offer is hardly attractive, and shedding readers uh, who are for understandably saying, why should I pay money to read what exists in this newspaper? It's really sort of the funeral march or death dance of daily newspapers. Now, were this just an issue about daily newspapers that I was talking about, their decline and possible demise in the next year or two, with the, uh, or, or severe retrenchment in the next year or two, that wouldn't be too severe of a crisis necessarily. Regrettably, though, we aren't just talking about daily newspapers, we're talking about the entirety of journalism as we know it in the United States. And let me just go through that. There was once a time, and anyone under the age of 40 will find this surprising news, that we had radio journalism in the United States on commercial radio that no longer exists. In the early 1970s, for example, if you were to go into a city like Washington, D.C., or any city of that size, any of the 20 largest cities in the United States, there probably would have been two dozen full-time working radio journalists just covering that community. That was standard issue. Just radio. So if the mayor did something, if there was some big breaking story, two dozen radio journalists would be over there covering it, just in radio. We'll wipe them out, get the eraser out. They're all gone. There's no more commercial newscasting to speak of in this country on radio. Television news. You know, local television news now, like you just say that, it's like a joke. People start laughing. You don't have to say anything more. Uh, in this country today, you know, we're such a diverse country, there's so much, you know, there's all the, there's people from so many different cultures and backgrounds, so many different interests. Uh, the one thing I found that unites all Americans, no matter where they're from, what their background is, everyone thinks their local TV news is the worst in the country. Uh, 
It's sort of our unifying thread nowadays in the United States. Uh, as for cable TV news or broadcast news at the national level, there's very little journalism there too. It's mostly punditry, uh, people pontificating, oftentimes pointlessly uh, reinforcing the conventional wisdom and offering much heat, very little light. So there's not much journalism there too. And on television, when you do get journalism on it, it's usually when they bring a print journalist on to talk about some story the print journalist has done and report on it and give some insight. So with newspapers go, there's not anything at radio or television to compensate or make it up. Newspapers are really the main game. And then there's, of course, the internet. And the internet, of course, is the future of all media. We know that. We're in that process now. But at present, there's no indication that at this point in time, the internet is poised to replace um, what we're losing and provide sufficient journalism. Uh, most of the stories that are linked to come from print originally. When those journalists stop collecting paychecks, those stories will stop being written, they'll stop being posted online. I love Wikipedia, I love the blogosphere, my wife thinks my head's been grafted onto a computer screen. Uh, but I have no illusions that that alone will not replace journalism. Uh, for social networking, for the internet to reach its promise of citizens' journalism, it has to work with a viable, strong journalism. It can't replace it. It has to have it as the basis for it to really help us improve and enhance uh, our political culture. And it's not doing it yet. The efforts of old media, of newspapers to move to the internet, have been a process of trading old media dollars for new media pennies. It simply hasn't cut it. And there's no reason to think it will in the foreseeable future. So we're entering, as I said, uncharted waters, dangerous waters. Literally, we could be down to just a handful of journalists uh, in community after community in large parts of the country with no working journalists whatsoever. Uh, huge state government with hardly any journalists covering it. Already we're down in most states where there used to be dozens of journalists covering the state house, just a handful are now covering it. Uh, with much more news going on, uh, nonetheless fewer journalists. It's a deeply troubling time and really the only people who can benefit by this frankly, are corrupt politicians and the interests they serve. They're the only ones who benefit by operating entirely in the dark. For the rest of us, it's an absolute nightmare. And I, I, I'll stop here. I could do an entire talk on just what the dimensions of the nightmare would be if we lose all journalism. Uh, but just trust me, it's bad news. If you, the more you think about it, the more depressing it becomes. Now, this is not an original statement I'm making. If you've been reading Time Magazine, The New Republic, The Los Angeles Times, uh, any of our major news media journals of opinion over the last three months, this is a recurring theme, writer after writer commenting upon the collapse of journalism, the decline of resources, the problems it causes. And there are two reasons that are generally given for why this is taking place today, two explanations. First is the internet. The internet is blamed because it's taken away advertising dollars from newspapers and it's taking away young people who would rather surf the web than buy a newspaper and read it. So the internet's bad guy number one, Bad guy number two is the depression uh, that has basically speared debt-laden media corporations and made it almost impossible for them to survive. So even newspaper firms that the operating expenses of their newspapers are still in the black or close to the black are paying such enormous amounts of debt that they're going to go under. They can't sustain even semi-profitable operations. So between the internet and the depression, we're told, um, that accounts for the crisis. And with that sort of analysis, the solutions that we come up with in almost everything that's, that's out there now are sort of small-scale uh, premises that we can get philanthropists to throw money in. Uh, maybe we can get all the foundations to kick in money to pay for journalism. Or possibly we can get the internet. We'll finally figure out a way to make money doing journalism. And that, that will solve the problem that we face. In the meantime, until it's solved, we'll have no journalism, politicians will be in the dark, and citizens will be clueless. Um, I think that these solutions are entirely insufficient. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of all the innovations that are going on. I, if you can convince foundations to give some group of journalists money to do cover news in the community, more power to you. But the idea that this will be sufficient to give us the type of journalism we need for uh, self-government is preposterous. There's simply no evidence whatsoever the foundation community has those sort of resources, uh, even anything close to it. That's simply not satisfactory. And even the journalists who are at the most uh, developed of these new models online, like the Min Post and the Twin Cities, are the first ones to acknowledge this is not the solution. This is not going to be satisfactory. 
we were part of a solution, but we have to go far beyond this if we're actually going to cover the events of the day and do it as journalists need to do. So this is what I want to talk about, is maybe a better way, in my view, to understand the crisis of journalism that goes a little deeper and a little more historical. And if we do that, maybe we can come up with stronger solutions that will get us not just back to where we were, because that's not good enough, but get us way ahead of where we were, where we need to be if we're going to have a genuine democracy in the United States. And I should preface this also by saying one other thing. What I'm going to talk about in terms of suggestions tonight before I'm done are things that if I'd said in a talk a year ago would have been grounds to declare me clinically insane. They're going to be extraordinarily radical. But understand a year ago if I stood up and said that George W. Bush would engage in policies that would make nationalizing the banking system eminently rational, you would have thought I too would be clinically insane. We are in historically uncharted times. The old system is collapsing, it's disintegrating. There's no status quo to be conservative about. The choice is what sort of future we're going to have, both for our economy, our politics, and especially for our media. Uh, so understand that's the context of this talk, that we're in a truly uh, unusual, rare time, the time, that, sort of time history that comes across once in a century. Uh, we're fortunate or unfortunate, depending on what happens, that it's on our beat. So how do we understand this crisis better? How do we understand the crisis of journalism? First of all, the internet and the economic depression aggravate the problem, they accentuate the problem, they accelerate the problem. They're not the cause of the crisis of journalism, the collapse of journalism today, uh, not at all. The real cause, the real causes, going backward, you have to start with the corporate conglomerate control over the news, which began in earnest in the 1960s and 70s, especially in the 1970s. Uh, this had devastating implications as chain owners, corporate owners, uh, began then in the late 70s and throughout and ever since the cutbacks in bureaus, the cutbacks in journalists. That process began then, did not begin uh, five years ago or two years ago. In from the mid-1980s to today in the city of Philadelphia, for example, as a representative example, there are half as many working journalists in Philadelphia in 2005 as there were in 1987. The number was cut in half working paid journalists. That's just Philadelphia. That's true in every city in the country. Those sort of cutbacks have been going on. Uh, this process began long before the World Wide Web kicked in. It started long before the economic depression, obviously. The loss of young readers certainly began long before two or three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience with my students since the 1980s, you see every five years a drop off in the number of young readers. I mean, to the point where there's virtually no newspaper readers today uh, that, I, that I encounter under the age of 25, daily newspaper subscribers and readers. Uh, it simply doesn't exist. And the quality of newspapers has shrunk too. Uh, a friend of mine named Tom Frank, some of you might be familiar with, who wrote What's the Matter with Kansas and The Wrecking Crew more recently. I was interviewing him for my radio show a while back and he was talking about research he was doing on American newspapers and he said he had the privilege to go back and read a lot of daily newspapers from different cities around the country from the 1960s and he said it was extraordinary the difference between that and newspapers of the last 10 or 15 years. You actually had coverage of all sorts of issues, uh, all sorts of people who were showing up in the news like Ralph Nader and civil rights leaders. This, it, was, it was like a rich rainforest of information compared to the, the frozen tundra of American daily newspaper of more recent times. Uh, there's been a sharp uh, difference, uh, and this is really the, the cause, if you want to look for the cause of the crisis of journalism, start there. Uh, as an industry, the collapse of the advertising revenues for newspapers did not start in the last six months or year. Newspaper advertising revenues, as a percentage of all advertising, has been gradually decreasing from 1950 to 1990, losing money to TV, which was booming during that period and growing. But the real sharp accelerated decline began in 1990. Then advertising got 26% of all advertising dollars. Newspapers got 26% of all advertising dollars uh, in 1990. This year it's expected to have maybe 10%. The sharp drop started in 1990, long before the World Wide Web and long before the economic depression. And finally on this point, as long ago as 20 years ago, there were already prominent editors and journalists from leading newspapers who were quitting the field uh, and writing books in protest to how corporate takeovers and corporate control slashing budgets and undermining the autonomy uh, and integrity of the journalism pro prospect. Uh, 
People like Jim Squires, editor of the Chicago Tribune, John McManus, Booth Kimball, uh, on and on. There are a number of books that were written and published a long time ago. So this is a long time, long standing tendency that the internet has accelerated, the depression has accelerated, but they didn't create. Then the logic is, well, maybe we want to go back to the golden age of the 1960s. Maybe that's what we need to do. That would solve our problems. We should just roll back the clock and try to recreate that glorious, wonderful, lovely, perfect period of human existence, the 60s. <laughs> well, even if that were possible, that wouldn't be desirable. I don't want to romanticize the journalism in the 1960s. Even at its best, and I think professional journalism in the United States was at its best in that period, professional journalism had its flaws. Uh, it has its flaws, not had its flaws, but it had its flaws even at its peak. The one you're most familiar with, the one that's most striking, the one we still live, hangs around our head like a noose today, uh, is the reliance upon official sources as the basis of what a legitimate news story is. And upon people in power as the legitimate range of debate uh, for what the, how to cover a news story. Uh, and this is a problem even at the height of the 1960s. Uh, when people in power weren't debating an issue, it simply wasn't considered legitimate news. Uh, we saw in the 1960s of the Vietnam War, our news media, uh, well into that war, spoon-fed us whatever Washington was saying, because there was really a consensus among leaders of both the Republican and Democratic Party for the war. The Gulf of Tonkin explanation to get us into the Vietnam War in 1964 was every bit as preposterous as anything George W. Bush tried to sell us to get into the Iraq War, and our news media whiffed on it completely. It just slapped the breeze. It didn't even get close to the ball. Uh, and that was at the high point of our journalism. In the 1950s, at the high point of professional journalism, the great journalist Ben Bagdikian made a tour of newsrooms in the northern United States, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit. And he went in there because he was trying to look at the race relations and racism in all these cities. And in city after city, you go to the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Detroit Free Press, the Chicago Tribune, you go in and talk to the editors, Say, let me see all your files on racism in your city. Let me see your coverage of the race relations in your city. And in every city, the editors would look at him like, oh, we don't have any racism here. Not in Chicago. Yeah, that's not a beat here. That's not a story. And it wasn't a story because to the people in power, it wasn't a story then. It became a story in the 60s, a big story. But our news media was asleep at the switch. And the early warning you need from a credible journalism to really get at problems before they explode, we lost. And that was a weakness of professional journalism. It's worth talking a little bit about professional journalism because there's a lot of confusion about that. And since we're about to lose it, it's, it's important to know what we're losing and what we need to get back of it and what we should be glad we're going to lose. Professional journalism was not inscribed in the Constitution. The notion of neutral, politically nonpartisan journalism sometimes erroneously called objectivity, uh, is a relatively recent one in American history. Uh, American newspapers until the 20th century were stridently partisan, stridently partisan. Oh, some scholar did a study of newspapers in 1892, as recent as that, and said that if you were to look at a newspaper that was a Republican paper then, and all papers were party affiliated as late as 1892, if you were to pick up a Republican newspaper in 1892, there was a very good chance they would never even mention the name of the Democratic candidate for president that year, and vice versa. That's how partisan these papers were. That's how partisan they were in 1892. There was no pretense that you're going to be neutral or fair. And you say, God, that's a nightmare. That's darkness at noon. That's hell on earth. How could this great country do something like that for 120 years? How did we survive it to make it to the 20th century? Well, partisanship isn't that evil if there are lots of different viewpoints. If there's you know, five different viewpoints, and if you don't like the existing viewpoints, you can start your own newspaper and create a sixth viewpoint or an eleventh viewpoint. And for the most part, during the first century of American history, that was the case. It wasn't an onerous expense to enter the market. It was, it was relatively competitive. And the First Amendment protected your right to start a newspaper and not be shut down. So having partisan press was actually a healthy thing. Partisan journalism becomes despicable and frightening when there's only one party when no one else is allowed to get in the game. And that more or less is what happened to American commercial journalism by the beginning of the 20th century, because in community after community, uh, newspaper economics led to the situation there were only one or two newspapers left. And it was impossible to start a new newspaper. In fact, almost, there's not a single news, daily newspaper started in this country since World War I, uh, despite the fact throughout the 20th century it was extraordinarily profitable. 
Uh, and you know these companies are raking in money, but because of the barriers to entry of newspaper monopolies, it was impossible to compete with them. The new paper in an existing market. I'm not talking about markets that didn't, you know, like some suburb someplace that came into existence after World War One. So. What happened by the progressive era was that once you have like a single newspaper, two newspapers, or even in a large city, a handful of newspapers, but it's impossible to start new ones, when they're partisan, and they're almost all taking stridently pro-business, anti-labor viewpoints, which was the order of the day in the progressive era, then partisanship smell, smells like month-old fish out on your table. Because then suddenly it's not like an open marketplace. You don't have any alternatives. You're certainly getting one viewpoint rammed down your throat and there's nothing you can do about it. And that created the greatest crisis in journalism uh, until the present time uh, in American history. And the solution to that crisis for the newspaper owners of the time was the creation of professional journalism, the notion of professionalism. For the first time, the revolutionary idea that the owner and the editor weren't synonymous, they weren't identical, and they wouldn't represent the owner's politics, that there would be this, uh, what they call the Chinese wall, the separation of church and state, the owners and uh, advertisers over here, on the other side of the wall, the journalists and the editors. And if you read a newspaper, you wouldn't know if the owner was a Republican or Democrat, a socialist, a vegetarian, because you'd only see what the trained professionals were doing in the newsroom. And their values were not those values, they were the professional values of journalism that they learned at schools of journalism. There were no schools of journalism in the United States in 1900. By 1920, every major school of journalism in the country had been founded. Oftentimes, I suspect in Oregon this is the case. Oftentimes, newspaper owners would go to the state capitol and demand that they create one at their state university. In Illinois, where I teach, uh, the newspaper publishers demanded it, and it's in state law that the Illinois, University of Illinois has to have a school of journalism. It's the only department protected by state law. It can't be closed by the university, because the publishers demanded they had to have a place to train their professional journalists. And professional journalism, in a way, if you understand it that way, what it did was it protected monopoly control because it said, don't worry who the owner is, that's irrelevant. The power now lies in the newsroom with the journalists and the editors, the trained professionals, and that you only have one newspaper doesn't matter, or one or two that are basically owned by the same sort of people doesn't matter. That you can't start a new newspaper doesn't matter because they're all trained professionals, they've got the professional values, you can trust them. They're, they're nonpartisan, they don't take sides, they're going to give it to you straight. That was the whole principle behind professional journalism. But if you think about it, that doesn't really answer very much. Because that sort of say, what goes on the front page? What gets a smaller treatment on page 10? And what doesn't get covered at all? What gets follow up two, three, four, five days? What gets one mention and gets dropped? It still doesn't tell you what values you use. That doesn't answer that, what I've just said. It tells you none of that. That still had to be fought over. That still had to be determined. In an American history, there was a tremendous fight over defining what professional journalism that took place in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It centered around the American Newspaper Guild, the Union of Print Journalists, which came into existence in the 1930s, behind several visionary, brilliant journalists, Haywood Brune, George Seldes, the young I.F. Stone, and they had a trenched, entrenched fight with the newspaper barons of their day trying to define what professional journalism be. In the viewpoint of Brune and Seldes and I.F. Stone, they were in favor of nonpartisan journalism. They didn't want a journalism that favored one party over the other, or one set of candidates over the other. Their vision was of a journalism that treated everyone in power with equal suspicion and equal skepticism, no matter who they were, and everyone who wanted to be in power. And they saw their views representing everyone outside of power. The journalism was a force for democratic uh, understanding and influence. And in their view, uh, that was what professional journalism should be. That's what democratic journalism should be. Afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted. Uh, that type of journalism uh, is still practiced today. Bill Moyers practices it. Chuck Lewis, uh, the great legendary journalist, uh, practices it. I think to the extent Amy Goodman um, uh, does journalism, because she's sort of a host, but the journalist on her program certainly practices that. Uh, but for the most part, that type of journalism was anathema to the newspaper owners of the 30s and 40s. Because if you think about it, basically being that critical of people in power, both in the business world and the uh, governmental world, means that journalists are going to constantly be pissing off all the people newspaper publishers need to kiss up to. And it was not, that was a clunker uh, of a move. And they much preferred a, a more tepid journalism that internalized their view of the world, which is what we got, which was basically um, legitimate journalism is defined by people in power. They set the range of debate. If they're debating an issue, you can cover it. 
If they're not debating an issue, it's very hard for a professional journalist to raise the issue. Because, for example, if everyone in power agrees we should invade country X, say Vietnam or Iraq, uh, and a journalist then tries to raise the issue, why are we invading country X? Well, the politicians say, why are you raising that issue? No one's talking about that. You've got your own ideological agenda. You're, you're not being professional. You're being partisan here because you're trying to lay in your ideology. They have to basically, a journalist can only ask that question if someone else in power is asking it. You say, hey, that senator's asking it, now you answer it. But if that senator isn't asking it, you have to shut up. That's the limitation of professional journalism. That was the part of professional journalism would have driven I.F. Stone insane, or Jellard Seldes, but it became the order of the day, even at our high water mark. But as I said in the 1960s, it really was much better than today. It truly, uh, our journalism was superior. The resources were much better. Uh, for journalists, the protection from uh, influence by owners was much better. Uh, and to give some sense of how things have changed from that period, uh, some of you in the, are old enough to remember this film, and some of you might have seen it, younger people, have you seen it on television or something? There's a film that Robert Redford was starred in in the 1970s called Three Days of the Condor. And it's a great spy film, and Robert Redford is like some rogue CIA guy who's got information about all sorts of crimes the CIA has committed. It's a, a 70s film. And he's being, the CIA is trying to track him down and kill him. And so the film is about him trying to avoid being killed by the CIA so he can get evidence of their crimes out and expose them. And the uh, end of the film, the closing scene, the happy ending, is Robert Redford finally has eluded them and he's entering the doors of the New York Times to deliver this pile of evidence. With the assumption, well, once the New York Times finds out, it gets exposed, all the other media in the country dive on the story like Watergate, the guilty parties get exposed, arrested, the bad doing stops, and we live happily ever after in a democracy, because that's what free presses do in a democracy. Well, that was the assumption, and people actually thought that. In 1974, that was, that was a credible ending to a movie. Today, if they did that ending, you know, it'd be a comedy, it'd be a, or a tragedy, but, or a farce, but it wouldn't be a drama. It wouldn't be a credible ending. And it's not just because the newspapers wouldn't cover it. In fairness to our media, it's not just their fault. It's not just the fault of the journalism. It's because for the last 30 years, increasingly, in our political system, even if you do expose chicanery, nothing happens to the people who do it. Even if you have the story, it don't have the follow-up. There aren't 10 new newspapers who push the story along until justice is done. The story comes out and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. The evildoers just go right on doing what they're doing like they have for the last eight years with no political consequences. And in that context, it's difficult to do political journalism. So what's happened in the last 30 years is the limitations of professional journalism have been magnified by the corporatization, the conglomeratization, which has cut back on resources, cut back on the autonomy of the newsroom, encouraged the commercialization of content, and accentuated its problems. So the viewpoint that sees our crisis of journalism as just being that there's been a cutback in reporters, and if we just had more reporters, everything would be fine again, I think misses the boat tremendously. I think the starting point to really make sense of where we have to go is to acknowledge the plain truth. Our journalism today is deplorable, for the most part. It's dreadful. I think people are scared that young people don't, aren't regular readers of our newspapers. I'd almost be more scared if they were regular readers of our newspapers. Certainly consumers of television news, for what passes for television news. I mean, let's go through some of the crucial issues of the last decade and look at how our journalism has handled them. The Iraq War. Swing and a miss. You know, three trillion dollars down the toilet, two trillion dollars. How many people have died? Our media laid an egg. Understand that in our Supreme Court defense of freedom of the press, going back to the Pentagon Papers and other Supreme Court cases, the number one reason uh, the defense for freedom of the press by the U.S. Supreme Court is to prevent us going into foreign wars uh, improperly without foreign public consent. That's the reason it's given why we have to have freedom of the press. Well, our press system laid a total egg there. Not simply there, though. A coverage of the economy. For the last 15 years, our news media and our so-called business press, which is a kept press owned by Wall Street, has been hyperventilating into housing bubbles, tech bubbles, financial bubbles, completely oblivious to the Gilded Age growth of inequality in our society, the deep economic problems, as our debt structure ballooned to be three times the size of the real economy today as to what our debt structure was in the 1970s. So basically you have three times as much debt, all making claims to the same 
amount of real goods and services that the debt eventually has to attach to. With no awareness what a preposterous and untenable situation this is, our news media completely missed the boat on that. Dropped the ball entirely. And the, the central things we need them to be covering. Consider the coverage of labor or poor people. Poor people in our news media largely only matter when they get in the way of rich people. Other way, they're, they're non-factors. They don't play a role whatsoever. In the United States in, the in 1950, there were roughly 1,000 full-time labor editors and beat reporters in American daily newspapers. Nearly 1,000. Do you know how many there are? I won't say today because there are only reporters left, but you know how many there were three years ago? Less than five. Less than five. It's simply not a beat anymore. Instead, we have a business beat. Uh, and in our political coverage on television, the sort of opinion setters, what we see is an obsession with spin over substance at every turn. So we have real problems in River City. Uh, and I'd say the moral of the story for us is simply this. The corporate system is dead. The corporate community has decided journalism is a non-starter. They've stripped it for parts. They're leaving it on the side of the road. They're moving on. Uh, if we want to create a better journalism, we're going to have to come up with a different system that actually is committed and will logically produce better journalism. And here's my argument, and this is probably where um, the most controversial thing I will say tonight, which is probably not saying quite a bit. Um, I think the only solution to this, the only way we're going to solve the journalism crisis is to understand it's going to take an extraordinary amount of government resources and subsidies to make it happen. There's no other way. It is the only way we're going to solve it, period. And let me take the next few minutes to explain why I make this claim. Now, the immediate response when you say that is, oh my God, that's unthinkable. That's anti-American. That's darkness at noon. You're calling for commissars to tell us what to think. How can you possibly suggest that? That goes against everything this country stands for, right? True? Are you with me? Yeah, you're nodding your head. But absolutely, I was in my crib at age four months, and I remember my father saying that to me. <laughs> Freedom of the press means get out of the way of rich people. That, that's there, they get it. And you were very lucky to live in this country. Four months old, I still remember that. Um, and I understand the concern, not to be facetious. I think the concern with government censorship uh, is supremely important and inviolable. It's an extraordinarily legitimate issue. But I think the way that it's presented and why I was being facetious is it's not meant to really engage in a legitimate debate on that issue or understand the principle involved, but it's meant to prevent a legitimate debate, to prevent understanding the real important principles that's involved. And I'd like to do now is explain a better way to understand the role of government in a free press, a more accurate way and a much more democratic way. First of all, government involvement isn't anti-American. It's quintessentially American. And this is where a little American history comes into order uh, for all of us. Uh, if you look at the founding of the Republic, uh, it was an obsession of the founders in the early Republic that we have a free press. Jefferson and Madison in particular, and I've been, as a scholar, at times been quite critical of both of them, especially Madison and some of their views. But when it comes to issues of freedom of the press, I have to give them high marks. These guys absolutely knocked it out of the park. They understood it uh, in their bone marrow that if you were going to have a constitutional system with self-government, where people govern their own lives, you could not have it unless citizens knew what was going on, unless they were informed. You could not have self-government, and you could not have citizens informed without a free press, a press system. That was, a, that was the starting point for them. That wasn't like, let's debate whether we need a press. It was, we have to have a press. And my books are filled with pages and pages of their quotes on this very point. The most famous of which we use as a title, John Nichols and I, for one of our books, where Madison just said basically, in frustration with some knucklehead who didn't quite get it, said, if you don't have a viable press system, you can't have self-government. You, what you'll have will be a tragedy or a farce, as a famous quote, but it will not be anything close to uh, self-government. You have to have a sustainable, viable press system. So the first job of the government the first job of the government was to make sure you had a free press, or else the whole Constitution doesn't work. That's how they understood it. And this is where the history is so important. If you look back at the founders, this wasn't just some public relations spin they cooked up to satisfy people 200 years later. They, they, you know, they walked the walk. What did they do? What did the founders do? Well, for starters, how seriously did they take the role of the state in creating a free press? They made it a, a rule 
that for a territory to become a new state in the United States, it had to have a certain number of newspapers. Because unless it had a certain number of newspapers per citizens, the people wouldn't be capable of self-government. So you couldn't even become a state until you had enough media so you understood what was going on in your state. That was, that, that, that was how important it was. That just scratches the surface. One of the most important things they did dealt with postal subsidies in the post office. Now, today I think most people, when they think of the post office, they think of uh, you know, lunatics who shoot people, buffoons like Cliff Clavin, junk mail. Uh, they have a whole assortment of crazy images. And it does great justice, injustice to one of the most important institutions in American history. The post office, uh, for much of its history, well into the 20th century's first and most important job was as the distribution arm for newspapers and periodicals. And prior to about the 1830s, all newspapers were distributed almost entirely by the post office. 90% of the traffic of the post office in the 1830s was daily newspapers or weekly newspapers. 90% of the traffic. And one of the great, it's in the Constitution that the Congress has to set up a post office. And one of the great debates in, in American history was in 1792 in the U.S. Congress when they were debating with this post office they set up, what are they going to charge newspapers to be distributed? Now today, of course, we would think that, of course, in 1792 members of the House and Senate took turns standing at the gavel, slamming their fist on the table and saying, full rate, no free lunch. These guys have to pay the full amount. This is a free market. We can't have any welfare cases in this country. Of course, we assume they were waving copies of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation and just trying to trump each other in their beloved praise of the free market. Right? Of course. This is America. That's what we were raised on, right? Right. <laughs> Not quite. This was the range of debate in 1792 on postal subsidies, postal prices for newspapers. At one extreme position was the position that they should be heavily subsidized. The cost of mailing newspapers would be much less than the cost of mailing anything else. The government, the people, the country, through the government, should take it upon themselves to heavily subsidize it to encourage more newspapers. Because that, that was such a huge cost for a newspaper. That was one extreme position. The other extreme position, that of James Madison, that of Benjamin Bache, uh, the grandson of Ben Franklin, one of the leading newspaper publishers of the day, was that all magazines, all newspapers at all times should always be free. Any charge for distribution was a form of censorship because the, the most vulnerable publications, the most controversial ones, are the first ones that go out of business if you charge anything for distribution. So that was, that was, that was the range of debate. That's how they viewed uh, the post office. That's what, that, that became the largest indirect subsidy or direct subsidy in American history before the Pentagon came into existence, was doing newspaper distribution. That's how serious this was. That range of debate continued for the next hundred years in Congress. It was a public debate. One of the real victories over postal subsidies came, this side won initially. It was heavily subsidized. They didn't get the free, but they kept fighting it. And finally, by the 1840s, one of the great victories came when the abolitionists were able to get weekly publications, free uh, postage, in their own county. And these were all the abolitionist papers, the smallest papers. They could finally stay in business because they didn't have to pay for postage anymore in their own county. It was a major victory for the abolitionist movement. So these were, these were serious political implications to these debates. And they were understood that way. They weren't just protecting a powerful industry here or there. And, and to give some sense of the extent of the subsidy, 90% of the traffic in 1830 of the post office was newspapers. It accounted for 2% of the post office revenues. That's a serious subsidy. 10% of the traffic did 98% of the revenues, 90%, 2%. That's a serious subsidy. They wanted to encourage uh, people to have wide variety of viewpoints. Secondly, that wasn't it. That wasn't, they didn't just stop there. The government under Madison and Jefferson, the State Department instituted uh, a subsidy where they paid three newspapers in every state from different political parties to publish State Department notices. And the whole purpose of it, as Madison and Jefferson put it, was to keep three good newspapers alive with different viewpoints in every state that wouldn't survive otherwise. It was flat out subsidy. And the third great subsidy, one that most historians are most familiar with, was that before the formation of the U.S. Government Printing Office in 1865, all U.S. government printing contracts were farmed out. And the printing companies were all newspapers, and it was a way to subsidize newspapers by giving them print jobs with their printing presses. All the, the equivalent of the Washington Post and New York Times prior to the Civil War, these were all subsidized newspapers. They weren't free market newspapers. They, 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 they survived, their budget was covered by getting printing contracts from uh, the U.S. government. So when Tocqueville came to the United States in the 1830s, 
and wrote in Democracy in America. He said, it's an extraordinary country. There's so much more print material in this country than there is in Britain or France or Canada, the three countries he studied in conjunction with the United States. And he was right, there was. And it wasn't a fluke. It had nothing to do with the free market. It had everything to do with brilliant and enlightened policymaking. And you know why it was brilliant and enlightened policymaking? Because look at those subsidies. That postal subsidy didn't favor one political party over another, didn't favor one viewpoint over another. Everyone could play. Abolitionists could play, slaveholders could play. It just made it possible for more voices to be heard, for journalism to prosper, to create a culture where people would be engaged with social life. All those subsidies that. And when we talk about government involvement, that's what we're talking about, those sort of subsidies. We're not talking about hiring someone to go in and kick Rush Limbaugh's ass and replace him with someone else. Not that, you know, but that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. We'll let Rush stay there. That's fine. But he's just not going to be the only voice in town. That's the point. There'll be other voices heard as well. You know, this point, I want to emphasize this. It's such an important point. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court, interestingly enough, has not really considered freedom of the press issues that much in its history. For every freedom of the press case that's gone in the First Amendment before the U.S. Supreme Court, there have probably been 10 or 12 freedom of speech cases. Uh, and in most people, and, and oftentimes I think they, they conflate the two, they think freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the same thing. Uh, you know, if you have the right to stand up in a corner and yell, it's the same thing as having the right to publish a newspaper or a magazine. Well, they aren't the same thing. It's why they're two separate entries in the First Amendment. Because uh, freedom of the press is a very different phenomenon. It serves a different role than freedom of the of speech. And when the Supreme Court has actually specifically looked at freedom of the press, it said some extraordinary things about what the government's role is with regard to our press system. Consider First Amendment absolutist Hugo Black, probably the most famous civil libertarian in the Supreme Court history. In one of his most famous decisions, Associated Press versus the United States in 1945, a decision basically when Associated Press and private media companies said the government couldn't regulate them and use the antitrust law to break up monopolies because that would violate their First Amendment rights. Hugo Black slapped that baby down. And in the majority opinion, one of the great opinions in American Supreme Court history, he wrote this. The First Amendment rests on the assumption that the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources is essential to the welfare of the public. That a free press is a condition of a free society. And in the piece, he argues the role of the government is to make sure that free press exists. Otherwise, you cannot have a free society. All our freedoms are lost. Now, you might say, oh, that Hugo Black, he was one of those left-wing guys from way back in the old days who didn't really understand how modern societies work. Well, how's this for you then? The most recent case in Supreme Freedom of the Press Supreme Court, the opinion of Reagan appointee Justice Anthony Kennedy from 1994. Quote, assuring the public has access to a multiplicity of information sources is a government, governmental purpose of the highest order. A governmental purpose of the highest order. And I think that if you want to stand back now, what people will eventually see about the moment we're in now is that the period in which we could trust capitalists to run our journalism and let them have it, which for better or for worse, and we, there's been better and there's been worse, it's been a mixed bag, but that period is an anomaly. You know, that started in the 1830s or 1840s and it's ending now. That hasn't been the permanent period. That wasn't the case in 1791 or 1805 or 1820, and it's not the case in 2008 and going forward. Uh, it was an anomaly. We, so we got suckered into thinking, yeah, we could always trust the Wall Street guys to handle journalism for us. They'll, they, they, got it, they got it wired. Well, now we know they, 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 they did it. They made a lot of money on it. They stripped it for parts. They took the car, left it on the side of the road, and they were to move it on, hopefully to jail some of them. Uh, and we're left, though, dealing with the fact that we don't have much journalism. Now what are we going to do about it? The ball's in our court at this point. Uh, another point I would make that's often misunderstood about our media system is we don't have a free market system. Our media system is nothing close to a free market system. It's built on some still, not just postal subsidies, but enormous direct and indirect subsidies and government monopoly licenses. We don't have a free market that uh, the winners are those that best serve the public. We have, a free mar we have a system where the government basically sets the terms that picks the winners that do the competing. Consider radio and television. The government gives massive, these licenses, monopoly licenses to radio and TV channels for the last 60, 70, 80 years for free to companies. 
Because they're inordinately valuable. And then these same companies can sell the licenses and make the profits off of them. We don't get a penny from it. That's an enormous subsidy that we've been giving to radio and television broadcasters, creating very uncompetitive markets in city after city after city. Monopoly licenses to satellite, cable television systems, telephone systems, those are all monopoly licenses, all of them. And even where they've opened up the markets, yeah, how many cable telephone sy television systems do you have of choice now? How many ph legitimate phone systems do you have choice? Very, very few. Usually, at best, you have a duopoly. And as any economist who studies microeconomic theory will tell you, a duopoly basically operates the same as a monopoly in terms of price and content for, for users. There's no real difference. Uh, it's just you have two people rather than one. So that's the truth of our system. The question isn't whether we're going to have subsidies and policies. We're going to have them. And I'm going to argue strongly we need them. The question is who we're going to have them for, how they're going to be determined, and to what effect. I think the key problem we've had in the United States is those policies and subsidies in recent years have been determined corruptly behind closed doors, secretively, uh, to benefit the phone companies, the cable companies, the satellite companies, the broadcasters, not to benefit us. And we've got to expose these processes, get involved with them, take them over, and demand policies and subsidies to serve our interests, to serve the interests of democracy and of journalism. And some of you, I think it was alluded to in the comment, in the introduction, that I helped form a group called Free Press, uh, which is active in media reform. And it's, it's grown tremendously on these very issues. We've shown, I think conclusively, the American people care deeply about having a viable press system. And that if they actually can understand that our, our media system isn't like the Rocky Mountains, it's not something that's just there that you can't do anything about. And it's going to be there for another 60 million years. Our media system is actually something we create. It's made in our name, but it's been made without our informed consent. If we actually participate in those debates, we can actually create a much better system. Who came up with the crazy idea of letting one company have 1,200 radio stations? Certainly, they didn't query me on that one. That was done behind closed doors. We weren't connected to that. And these companies destroy radio journalism in the country. No one asked us if we thought that was a good idea. But it's made in our name, our monopoly licenses, without our informed consent. So the principle of the whole movement is to bring out crucial public policies from behind the closed doors and make them uh, subject to informed consent. So if we have that debate and if we have the subsidies, let's then turn to the other, let's get to the very end now. Let's go to the final chapter of the book. Where do we want to end up? What sort of media system do we want to have at the end of this process? That's a really good question. You know, I think we have to start from the premise that eventually everything's pretty much going to be digital. I still don't know what that means exactly, but it's not going to be old media. But we don't know how long that process is going to take, and we shouldn't be so quick to think it's going to be over in the next six months or year by any stretch of the imagination. But the crucial ingredient here isn't the medium, it isn't paper or ink, it's newsrooms. What we have to have in every community are competing independent newsrooms of well-paid journalists covering the community. And you need a newsroom because you need editors who are vetting material, fact-checking material. You need people working together, collaborating. Uh, this isn't something you can just have people in trust funds in their pajamas doing on their computers. You know, that's not going to cut the mustard. It takes people getting an income in a newsroom, accountable to someone, competing with other people, pushing stories along, accountable if they blow a story. Uh, and praised if they do a good job on it. We need that. That's the starting point, baseline. We need to have a media that has a range of political viewpoints uh, and have some media that tries not to be especially opinionated. Uh, but we know what the viewpoints are. We know where they're coming from. There's nothing masqueraded in it. We need to have different types of ownership models. One of the great lessons of the corporate era, one of the great lessons of the Soviet era, is that a single type of ownership model, be it state or private corporate, is unacceptable. We want a heterogeneous, pluralistic system. So ideally what we would have is a combination of commercial ownership, cooperative, staff ownership, municipal ownership, nonprofit ownership. Uh, and we have to be open-minded about what works best where. But we have to think in those terms. Structurally, we don't want a centralized system with one type of ownership. We want to keep it as diverse as possible. There can be no censorship. And there has to be a strong effort to limit commercial control over any content of journalism, to prohibit that, make that un impossible. The right to start a new medium must always be inviolable. If you don't like the media you have access to in your community, you've got to always have the right to start your own medium. You don't have to get anyone's permission to do that. But all of this, all of this will require public money to work. Because there is not a commercial model to make that happen, what I've just described. Not a commercial model. And if we don't have what I just described, I don't think we can have much of a democracy.
We might be able to recreate what we've had for the last 30 years, but frankly, that hasn't been much of a democracy. Because if for the last 30 years we had a better democracy, I don't think we'd be in the hellhole we're in right now. We would have nipped these problems in the bud long before we got to the side of the cliff and we're looking down at the bottom right now. Uh, we've got to do better than that. We can't just go back to 1992. We can't even go back to 1967. We've got to transcend it. And what we've got to do is build a credible journalism that then can combine with the internet and the blogosphere and citizen journalism and really create something new and special that's far more democratic, far more inclusive to draw people into public life. We have the ability to do that. What we have to have now is the vision and the will and way to do it. Let me put a few more comments on this and I'm going to give you some specific plans. But I want to, another way to think about journalism and the role of the state is to understand that journalism is a, what economists call a public good. And a public good is something that society needs, but it, the individual marketplace will not deliver. Uh, and we all understand what public goods are. The classic case is military spending, military defense. If we just said the government's getting out of military defense altogether, now some of you are going to clap, I know. But if we were to say that in general, in principle, and we're just going to leave it to George Soros to bankroll it out of the goodness of his heart, and what Madison Avenue to put ads on bombs, and they'll pay for defense. It, of course, and then people could voluntarily give money. We know it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because I wouldn't voluntarily give money to defense because I know I'm going, to get this, I'm going to be protected by the same defense of the chumps who pay for it. So I'll let them pay for it. That's why it's a public good. That's why the state has to take over and cover it. Public education the same way. It's a public good. We know that if we turn it over to commercial interests and charities, we would not, we'd have a woefully ignorant society uh, that, could, that would collapse. We'd all suffer by it. So it's a public good. Well, journalism, too, is a public good. And we've been confused about that again because commercial interests ran so long, we said, well, the market can handle that one. Well, maybe for better or for worse, the market did, but now the market has laid an egg. It's getting out of there. We have to move on. So the way I would say we have to approach this and solve the problem is in two stages. Immediately, immediately we need a journalism stimulus. It's got to be part of the next stimulus package. And believe me, there are going to be a lot more of these coming. The one we got so far isn't going to cut the mustard uh, for what's coming down the pike. What I think we need to do, and listen carefully to my plans, because you can see there's no government commissar in any of this stuff. There's no darkness at noon. Listen, you know, I, I'm more concerned about the government than anyone, and these guys, who, anyone in this room. I mean, I've been criticizing Republicans and Democrats for 30 years. They're going to start locking people up. I'm not, not like, I'm, I'm at the front of the parade. So believe me, I, I'm not in, in interested in letting government lock anyone up. Let's get that clear. Um, what we need is a three-year, $60 billion stimulus, $20 billion a year for journalism. And this is what it would entail. Three years. For magazines, any magazine in the country that has less than 25% ads, free postage, distributed for free. Any magazine, whatever you're doing. So the, the Klan magazine gets it, the revolutionary communist guy get it. Everyone in between. Whatever your content is, it doesn't matter. Less than 25% ads, free postage. That will keep a lot of publications alive that right now are about to go under because postage is such a serious cost for these publications. And those are all going to have websites too. They're going to be putting material up for web. These are the things that get linked on the Huffington Post and in Daily Coast that you're reading come for a lot of times from these publications. They're breaking stories no one else is covering. Secondly, for every citizen in the country, you can take $200 off your taxes, not on your taxable income, but your taxes, and use it to subscribe to a daily newspaper. Any daily newspaper of your choice. Basically, the government's going to buy you a subscription to a daily newspaper. If you want it. And if you don't want it, you don't have to use it. You say, thanks, I'd rather pay the government. I don't want to read a daily newspaper. It's your choice. You can pick whichever one you want. doesn't matter. You can subscribe to any paper. Up to $200, government will cover it. This will give our daily newspaper, as long as they've got, a, the only criteria I'd say is they've got to publish at least five times a week, no more than 40% ads, and at least 24 pages. So we can't some, someone scam this, you know, uh, some bunko scheme. But this would buy our newspapers three years to start to get their act together, try to make a segue, keep a lot of journalists working in a lot of communities who wouldn't have jobs otherwise. And I think a lot of people would do it. It would cost a lot of money, well worth it. We can't afford to lose another 30,000 journalists in the next year, year and a half, which is what we're looking at right now. Third, one of the real crises we have in journalism has been young people are not involved with media enough, with journalism enough. They've lost a connection to it. I think the government should say to any middle school, high school, college, university, community college that wants to have a weekly, even daily student newspaper, 
government will foot the bill if they want to participate. Get students doing media again. Get journalism alive in our schools again. You know, there's a study that was done by the, I think the Pew Foundation or the Knight Foundation that showed that students who actually did journalism in, part, in school newspapers had a much richer appreciation of all our freedoms than students who didn't. They really sort of understood the importance of freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And the students who had no connection to journalism in student media, um, the percentages were much lower. It was a frightening survey. I think we had to get people immersed in doing media, in doing journalism. Duke Ellington, the great musician, had a taxonomy for, mu taxonomy for music. He said there's two types of music. There's good music, and then there's the other stuff. Well, that's how journalism is. There's good journalism, and then there's the other stuff. And until we get a lot of people doing it, the other stuff is too prevalent. Uh, and I think one of the complaints journalists have is that today you can get away with doing mediocre stuff a lot more than you used to because you don't have a market of readers who's as critical as they used to be because they're not used to the good stuff. And until we get people doing it, we aren't going to have the good stuff. Now, all that stuff I just talked about, there's no darkness at noon, all that stuff's going to be online. So we'll be filling up cyberspace in the digital realm with all sorts of great material from these subsidies right away for the next three years. And here comes the most important one. This is, this is actually the suburbs. Now we're going to get downtown. We've got to ramp up our public and community media. We've got to seriously ramp up our, immediately our public and, and community media. And notice I say media, not broadcasting. So I'm talking about what we think of as broadcasting. But all public and community broadcasting has a web presence. And that's going to increasingly become their identity over time. So we might as well start calling them public media. Let me give you some figures that I think will astound you. They certainly astounded me when I saw them. Compared to the United States, spending per capita on public media, uh, public and community radio and television stations, you know how much Canada spends per capita more than we do? The United States? 16 times more. Do you know how much Germany spends more than us? 20 times. Japan? 43 times. 43 times. 43 times. Britain, 60 times. And here you go. Those dungeons, where, those gulags of Scandinavia. Finland and Denmark. You know how much more they spend per capita on public media than we do? 75 times. 75 times. And you know, my wife's Norwegian. I have a lot of, I go back to Norway quite often and I listen uh, to incomprehensible Norwegian media with her all the time. And uh, what's striking though is every community in Norway has public radio journalists covering their little tall, small town. There's just tons of radio journalists because they have so much resources. And they're great, there's no ads. I mean, it, it's real journalism. It's really covering their communities. We can, there's no reason we can't have that. Why do we have to be such paupers? Why can't we, you know, you know how much we spent on public media uh, this year, what our budget is? $450 million. Now, that, of course, that sounds like big money, right? $450 million, but it isn't. We should be spending $10 billion minimum. That should be the starting point. And that money should all go to be hiring journalists, out-of-work journalists, get them to work right now in community after community that has no coverage anymore in small towns in this country that might have a public or community station. Get some journalists back to work, covering it, get journalism alive and well. You know, it gives them a sense of our priorities. We spend roughly 10 times more than what we spend in public media for Pentagon public relations to convince us that the wars we all oppose are good wars. So we're spending 10 times as much on Pentagon PR than we are on public media in the United States today. That's got to change. That's absurd. Um, so this is a high price, granted, $60 billion. And again, a year ago, if I'd made these suggestions, it would have been, people would have been laughing, throwing stuff at me, thinking I was deranged, clinically insane, laughing. Now this is perfectly sane, it's perfectly rational, because this is what it's going to take to solve the problem. Nothing else will work. Even when we're done with this, just this part, that's still not the end of the job. We've still got to come up with a long-term coherent plan to convert daily newspapers into viable, sustainable newsrooms for the long haul, and hopefully create a situation where we can have one, two, three such viable, sustaining newsrooms in the same community competing. And it's going to take public money, it's going to take imagination, and I think we've got to treat this as seriously as we treat things like climate change, as we treat pandemics, because it's that serious, it's that important uh, for self-government. And I want to say one final word on why I think this isn't as absurd as it would seem otherwise. The times we're in politically are so radically different than any times in our lifetime. All the verities we've heard for the last 30, 40, 50 years can be thrown right out the window.
Just the notion that we're talking about nationalizing the banks as we speak. Just the notion that um, you know, they're spending trillions of dollars right now, the Federal Reserve, writing checks to banks over a trillion dollars without really any news coverage of it. Ben Bernanke's doing this. Um, that, that this is just, they're throwing money around that's unthinkable. Uh, and they're throwing it around because we're in a crisis that's really unimaginable. We, I don't think anyone really fully grasps the dimensions of it yet. But in moments like this, in crises like this, where the, where the center isn't holding, where the status quo is failing, it gives us extraordinary opportunities. And we have an opportunity now in this moment to really democratize our society, to really make journalism something uh, that can serve the role it needs to serve in a free society of engaging people, monitoring people in power, drawing some public life. But there's a downside too. In a crisis like this, it's not like there's only an upside. Really bad things can happen in crises like this too. And I'm an optimistic person by nature, so I'm, I'm the good cop here. I'm emphasizing all the great things that can happen. Understand that in the last moment historically in the world, like the one we're going through right now, the 1930s and early 1940s, there was a range of different ways countries had dealt, dealt with their equivalent crisis that we're entering right now. Uh, in Sweden, uh, in Norway, because their upper classes were entirely discredited during that period and they had very strong labor movements, they ended up, as a result of that, leapfrogging those countries from very backward countries to being countries with the least amount of inequality in the industrial world, uh, universal health care, 90% unionization, the highest standard of living in the world. That's how they solved that critical juncture. The United States, we solved it by remaining democratic, by instituting labor unions with the Wagner Act, by social security, uh, by a number of the things that are considered staples of American civilization today. Germany, well, they had a different way to deal with it. Uh, and make no mistake about it, no depression, no Hitler. That, that's, that, that's the first rule of German historian tell you. It took the depression to create the political climate that made it possible for Hitler. And I don't think we want to go into a crisis of severe unemployment that's prolonged and severe stagnation that's prolonged and not have any journalism. I don't think we want to have every conspiracy nut go unchallenged uh, with whatever cockamamie theory they come up with to try to explain the crisis we're in. I think that's not acceptable. So the, the battle for journalism has to be at the heart of the battle for social justice, for sanity, for solving the economic crisis, and solving the political crisis that really aided and abetted uh, the economic crisis. So thank you all very much for your You've been listening to media scholar, historian, and founder of Free Press, Professor Robert McChesney. The title of his lecture is The Life or Death Struggle for Journalism and Self-Government. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Robert McChesney is the Gutzel Endowed Professor in the Department of Communications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His work concentrates on the political economy of communication, 20th century media history, international communications, media and communication policy, and media and social change. His books include Rich Media, Poor Democracy, Communication Politics in Dubious Times, Our Media, Not Theirs, The Democratic Struggle Against Corporate Media, co-authored with John Nichols, The Problem of the Media, U.S. Communication Politics in the 21st Century, Tragedy and Farce, How the American Media Sell Wars, Spin Elections, and Destroy Democracy, also co-authored with John Nichols. And Communication Revolution, Critical Junctures and the Future of Media. Robert McChesney also hosts a weekly radio program, Media Matters, available online as a podcast at will.illinois.edu slash media matters. To find out more about the work of Free Press, the organization co-founded by Robert McChesney, please visit their website at www.freepress.net. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Robert McChesney spoke at the University of Portland campus in Portland, Oregon, on February 26, 2009.
Okay, uh, to repeat it, the comment was that the ethnic and, and non-English speaking media too, in general, um, are flourishing now with these communities. I think they are flourishing. I think they could flourish even more. And I think we should try to get them flourishing even more. They're flourishing relative to a sinking ship. So if you're on a raft, the Titanic's going down, say, hey, I'm glad I'm on the raft. That's not good enough. We need ships, not rafts. Um, as for the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission is the body that hands out these monopoly licenses for radio and television. For, it, it regulates cable, uh, telephone licenses, and therefore really the internet. It's an extraordinarily important body. It's probably one of the most important government agencies because it doesn't just regulate, it issues these monopoly licenses. I mean, it creates industries. When it gives a cell phone company a license to Spectrum, it's basically setting that company up forever. I mean, it, it creates the industry, it doesn't just regulate it. That's why it's such an extraordinary, extraordinarily important body. Uh, and right now, the, the Obama administration will, since he's in office, the Democrats will control the FCC. They'll have three members. He's appointed a new FCC chair, and we're expecting a dramatically different FCC. The way the FCC works is there are five members. The chair completely controls it. It's not like the Supreme Court where the chief justice is just first among equals. In the FCC, the chair is basically that runs everything. They control the schedule, when you vote or anything. The entire staff works for the chair. Each of the other four members is a small staff. They're basically on the outs. Uh, so having the control of it for Obama makes all the difference in the world. Um, we're very optimistic that this will be uh, a body that will be open-minded about the issues we're dealing with. But I mean, let's have no illusions um, about politicians in general or the Obama administration. Uh, what will move this administration to good things will be the same thing that would move any administration to good things, political pressure. And there's two sources, ultimately, of political pressure in any society. Uh, Saul Alinsky, uh, the community organizer who at one time inspired Barack Obama, put it. There's organized money and organized people. And the only way you beat organized money is with organized people. We have to put immense pressure. This isn't the time to back off, say, okay, now Obama's in, I can go back to sleep till 2018. This is the time to ramp it up. Now at the time, if you do your organizing, you might actually get effects. Now if you actually push, you might actually get something good out of it. Uh, you have a much better chance. This is the time to ramp up our activism. And I, I'm very optimistic, if we do, that we can win victory after victory, including everything I talked about tonight, as, as, a, as absurdly uh, wild as it might sound. I think as the dust settles in the crisis we're entering, I think it will increasingly move into the mainstream is the only way we're ever going to get out of this in any serious manner. Yes? The question is, do I consider media deregulation an economic failure, or is this what it was intended all along, to sort of just make it short-term, make a lot of money and let it collapse? Uh, well, I think the term media deregulation has always been a misnomer. Because uh, deregulation implies, the, you know, who doesn't like deregulation? Who wants to be regulated? Hey, deregulate me. I don't want you regulating me. Uh, but deregulation implies it's an open, anyone can have at it. Like when they say we're going to deregulate radio ownership, that's supposed to mean, okay, now I can start radio broadcasting. It's deregulated. Everyone gets a chance at it. But that's not what they mean by deregulation. Deregulation meant basically that one company could gobble up more of the monopoly licenses and make it a less competitive industry without any public service obligations for getting these monopoly licenses. That's, that's just re-regulation for rich guys. That's not deregulation, that's a misuse of the English language. So we didn't have deregulation, we had re-regulation for rich guys. And this is probably true in other areas, but in terms of media, every time you hear the term deregulation, automatically just substitute re-regulation for rich guys. And you will have the truth of what's actually taking place. It's not a deregulation, it's not a free market or open market, it closes the market. If you think they deregulated radio, try broadcasting on some commercial signal. Say, hey, it's my turn now, it's deregulated. See how long it is till you're in a federal penitentiary. That's how deregulated it is. The next member of the audience observed that the speaker's definition of what constitutes journalism and who he considers to be a legitimate journalist rests very heavily on what he considers nonpartisan. And yet, this member of the audience suggests, that's been a big part of the problem. In journalism, in America... We've spent the past 40 or 50 years recognizing the pluralism we have in America, and the fact is that nobody agrees on what nonpartisanship is. So where does that leave us with your proposal to get the government involved and to get more nonpartisan journalism? Well, I don't know where you... I, I must have 
uh, I, I must have uh, had a, a sort of a hallucinogenic moment in my talk if you deferred that I was saying that. that. I don't recall saying the point was to get more nonpartisan journalism exclusively. I thought I made it clear that I think what we need is a range of political viewpoints and acknowledged it's openly, but I think there can be some media that's more, attempts to be more nonpartisan. I don't think everyone has to say it's, there's no such, th I think there's some things that are more objective than others. I really do. I don't think, and I think we all know that intuitively. When you go to a website, you intentionally infer, okay, I know where they're coming from. This is probably, I see where they're going, this is probably a little more nonpartisan. They don't have, or another website, I know their politics are, they're probably going to shade it this way or that way. And I just say we have to know what the politics are ahead of time. And I, we shouldn't discourage it. If we have a range of viewpoints, I think that's good. But not everyone's going to have an explicit viewpoint that drives it. I think some journalism will be less partisan than others. And I think that's good. I think, but I, I don't think we should have an illusion there's only one type of journalism either. That's the point I was making. Yes. The next member of the audience liked the idea of the three-year, $60 billion stimulus package for journalism, but asked how that might actually happen. Well, I think what's going to have to happen is um, Free Press, the group I work with, and I'm no longer the president of it. I started it. I'm still on the board. Now I'm sort of their leading dissident. I'm sort of on the road trying to rouse, rabble rouse to push them to take up this call. They're taking up the issue of journalism. But, you know, what we need to do is just um, make it clear to politicians, to whatever group we work in, how important this is to us. And we're working with uh, the Newspaper Guild and working journalists. Uh, we're working with all sorts of organizations. The campaign's just starting. This is really this is New Haven tonight. This is the, we're just giving a test run on these ideas to see how they fly. Uh, but over the next six months or nine months, it's going to be increasingly a campaign that grows. If you are guys aren't signed up for the free press web, it's free to become a member, to stay tuned in on stuff, go to freepress.net, do so. Is anyone here a member? Okay, do you ever get like, emails for penis enlargement or from Nigeria to give you all your money. No, we don't give you any of that sort of stuff. You just, it's, it's very few emails, it's always selective, you aren't going to be bombarded. Um, I'd urge you to do it, you, and you can get out if you, for whatever reason, don't want to do it. Uh, but it's going to be a political campaign, and we've got to get all hands on deck. I mean, I think the way you win this fight is that you get all the groups that have crucial issues, political issues, labor in particular, environmentalists, We've all got a stake in this. The, uh, you aren't going to win environmental fights if there's not journalism covering these issues or labor fights. We aren't going to solve the economy without journalism. So everyone who's got an issue, I understand we've got to have journalism in there. You know, that's part of the answer. So we've got a lot of education and organizing work to do. The good news is that there's a lot of publicity about it right now. I mean, there's, this is a really heavily talked about issue. And I think what I'm trying to do is just push the debate along. Because if we're going to spend a year asking if George Soros is going to bail out every newsroom in America, it's a year we're wasting in my life. And we don't have a year to waste right now, frankly. We've got to get down to business right away. Yeah. It's a great question. The question is about the Fairness Doctrine and how, where it stands today and how it fits into the future, present and future. The Fairness Doctrine was put in place uh, in the late 1940s by the Federal Communications Commission. And it basically said to the radio and tel later television broadcasters of America, look, we're giving you a free license to monopoly spectrum, so you're going to become multimillionaires at the government's, thanks to us, by getting this monopoly license for a radio TV station. In exchange for that, we expect you to do two things. One, we expect you to cover important issues in your community, public affairs, to not just do junky sitcoms and crap like that. And two, when you do cover important issues in your community, public affairs, you present at least two viewpoints. You don't push one partisan agenda. Because unlike a newspaper, if you can start a new newspaper in theory, not in practice, in theory, if they don't like the viewpoints, radio and television, there's a strict number of stations in the community, and they can't add any none. That was the idea behind it. So um, the problem with the Fairness Doctrine was that none of the stations paid any attention to it. The part A part, they didn't cover their communities. I mean, what they do is they put on some public affairs show Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m., and they find the most boring person on earth to do it. I don't know where they found these guys. And of course, no one would ever watch them. Uh, and, you know, so they, they, they never did anything beyond that. And they claim, well, we would do it if we, could, if we didn't have to put two viewpoints on. So finally, the Reagan administration scrapped it. And uh, oftentimes that's attributed to the rise of right-wing talk radio, the Rush Limbaugh's dominating the commercial airways. And today, I think for a lot of liberals and Democrats in particular, are saying now let's put it back in so that all these radio stations will have to at least 
give Rachel Maddow a show next to Rush Limbaugh, it won't just be right wingers. Um, it's ironic because I'm not pushing for the return of the fairness doctrine. Free press is that no activist I know of is. None of us like it. Uh, the only people who are talking about it are Rush Limbaugh and the right wingers who are using it for fundraising. They're going to their right wing base and saying, look, these guys want to take us off the air, give us your money. And that's all that's been going on with it, as far as I can tell. They're, they're the ones who are making an issue out of it. And I'll tell you why the Fairness Doctrine is a non-starter to me. Um, I don't like government involvement with content. I, I think enlightened policymaking minimizes that to the greatest possible extent. That, to me, is too much government involvement with content. I think the rational thing in a free society is set up a system where you'll have enough viewpoints around, you don't have to worry about stuff like that. If we had better ownership rules for radio, for example, I think we'd eliminate that problem right away. Part of the Rush Limbaugh problem came when they relaxed the ownership rules so one company could own as many radio stations as it wanted in the country. Well, suddenly if Clear Channel or some other company owns a thousand stations, well, it's easy enough to sign up Rush Limbaugh or Gordon Liddy to be on 300 of them. Radio, in my mind, there's no justification for allowing anyone to own more than one station at this point. There's no justification. Economically, the cost of putting on a good radio signal is marginal. I mean, it's very low, the digital technologies. I think what we ought to do is just change the law. Okay, for the sake, I'll compromise with the Republicans, too. You can own two radio stations or two TV stations. But then what would happen, all these value, these things, they're, they're all losing money, you know, they're all dumping them anyway. But if you make that rule change, the value of radio and TV licenses would plummet. You'd only own one or two. And people would buy them in their own community. If you only own one, you aren't gonna, if you're in Portland, you're not going to buy one in San Antonio, you're going to buy one in Portland. So suddenly you'd have all the TV and radio stations in the community owned by local people. And I got a feeling that would take care of the problem right there. And the price would come down so far, it wouldn't just be the richest people in town owning them, because they're losing so much value as old media. And it could actually become a dynamic part of our media culture again. Radio today is such a cesspool of, of pus. I mean, it's, it, it deserves to die. Let's, let's, let's have a renaissance. Let's open it up. Let's give people have it again. It's the people's medium. It's the least expensive medium in the world. I love radio. It's been murdered by our policies. Over there. The next audience member observed that it had taken a while for newspapers to be accepted as credible sources for news. How long might it take for the Internet to be accepted as an independent, credible source for news? That's a good question. And I, I mean, I think... It's not, it's less about a technology. It's not about the internet per se. So I, I get on the computer screen and I t believe it. It's the source. I mean, what's it gonna take to have original, credible, tr good journalism dominate on the web? And my argument, I mean, I'm not gonna be Johnny OneNote, but you can't get away from this. You know, if we leave the web journalism to people on trust funds or people in their pajamas who can't get a job or have issues psychologically or whatever, it's probably not going to be very good. I'm not going to trust it. We've, I mean, we've got to have people who are journalists, who have some experience, who are edited and vetted, who have to stand up for their work, who fact check it. And not that's the only thing. I'm, I'm all for bloggers. I really, I'm a blogger. I mean, I blog. And most of my blogs wouldn't be good without journalism. What, you know, let me put it this way. If, um, if I work in a factory all day or a coal mine, then I go home and I make dinner for my kids and I do the laundry and I clean up the house and then I veg out in front of the TV for an hour and have a beer. And then before I go to bed at 11 o'clock, I say, no, okay, now I'm going to go be a web journalist. And I sit down at the computer and do my blog on North Korea, and what politics of North Korea. It's probably going to suck. I won't know anything about North Korea. But if there are 30 journalists covering North Korea, who, for different media around the world that I have access to on the web and I can read their stuff, I might be, in the, over time, able to like know enough so I can read an article and criticize it and have something smart to say and might not write a blog on it. Like a jazz musician, I could, I could improvise on a melody that's given to me, but I'd have to need that melody in the first place. And without the melody of journalism, it's just noise. With journalism, it's a great improvisation. Yeah. The next member of the audience observed that even in a prosperous economy, a small newspaper can be wiped out by one liable case. Would the speaker's plan for a new media system address this sort of challenge to independent, well-functioning news media? Well, the issue of libel, you're absolutely right, it's very important. And I, my plan, you've heard my whole plan, so there's no secret components I haven't told you about. I haven't gotten to libel yet. I'm gonna, I'm, but I agree, that's an issue that's got to be taken up. And, but I, but it really, I mean, I'm not going to, 
I'm just trying to get the ball in play, and then I'm going to let everyone else kick it around, and hopefully they'll kick that too. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. No, I understand. This is a great question. The, the questioner uh, is asking about, you know, there's been sort of a sociological shift in the people who become journalists over the last hundred years from being primarily a working class or middle, lower middle class profession for the most part uh, to being increasingly, especially at the more elite media and upper class uh, profession. And does that influence the nature of news? How does it influence it? It's a great question. Uh, there's is there an interesting uh, urban legend that, that sort of colors that question. In 1929, uh, when the stock market crashed, uh, the story goes that in the Boston Globe's newsroom, and back in Boston, when it came over the ticker that the stock market crashed, that Wall Street had gone into the toilet on Black Monday or Black Friday, Black Sunday, uh, that apparently when the news was read into the newsroom at the Boston Globe in 1929, the entire newsroom stood up and gave it a standing ovation. Because they were just so glad those rich fucks finally got it. <laughs> After 10 years of every yuppie in Boston rubbing it in the face how rich they were getting while these guys had to work for a living, they were delighted they finally got theirs. And then the story goes, 1987, another Wall Street collapse, Boston Globe newsroom floor, news comes over, and everyone's on the phone to their broker. Get me out fast before I lose everything. And I think that sort of illustrates exactly the point you're making. You know, I'm, I'm a, I think that's a very crucial issue. And I, I think that um, I, I, it's one of the issues, though, because, I mean, there are structural factors that no matter what the background of a journalist is going to shape what they do that I think are more important. But I do think in certain areas, and the one you highlighted is especially true, the research by a sociologist named Martin Gillens, and I don't know if you're familiar with this book, if you aren't, you'll like it, G-I-L-E-N-S, shows that um, in coverage of communities of color in, in journalism, that the one variable that really seems crucial has been uh, the whiteness of journalists. Their, their, in a, their, their lack of comfort and familiarity with communities of color has made it much more difficult for those issues to be discussed and, and covered by journalists. And that's the sort of area where precisely um, the whiteness of our newsrooms and the class basis of our newsrooms, because working class whites are going to have much more familiarity with the institutions of people of color or working class uh, than with upper class whites. So I, I think it's a very important issue. Yes, up there. Okay, how come if mentally unstable people can buy radio stations, and I like that, why can't they be bloggers, and why can't blogging on the internet be legitimate just with, vol with citizens, volunteer labor, and democratized? Is the, the, it's still a democratic vehicle. Actually, I'm in complete agreement. I, I, I'm a blogger. I, I live on blogs. I read them incessantly. But my point simply is blogs will be of infinitely greater value when they have journalism to work off of that if, it's, if they're just sort of pontificating to each other and no one's actually doing any digging, they lose some of their value. That doesn't mean they don't have value, some of them can still be great. But the best blogs are ones that actually do hard work, that really turn stuff up. And the really great blogs are filled with links to hard news stories that other people have done they're familiar with. And that's what I'm saying. To really get the richness of the internet, the genius of it, I think it requires a healthy, vibrant journalism. And that means the sort of journalism we're eventually going to end up with is going to work with the internet and become very different than what we're familiar with today. I don't know where it's going to end up, but I think it could be a much better place. But the starting point for that is having the basis of real institutional journalism in our communities, people actually covering our communities and covering the world. Yes? The question is, um, today, increasingly, journalists come from journalism schools and don't have the same liberal arts background that journalists may have had in the past. And is that a problem or is it a rhetoric? It is a problem, true or false, or comment on it, all of the above. Um, well, I'm not so sure of that. I mean, I really don't, I'm not, I don't know empirically how true that is. I know that at uh, the journalism schools I've been connected with at Illinois and Wisconsin, uh, great steps are taken in the curriculum to make sure students have a lot of history and, and, and liberal arts courses. So I can't, and because it's, it's recognized as a serious issue that you shouldn't become a journalist if you haven't taken history or politics or sociology and know something of the world. So, uh, but I agree with the premise of your question, that is important. I agree that uh, someone should, just learning how to write or learning certain editing skills is insufficient. It's, it's necessary but insufficient. You, you need to also learn history, politics. I think you should have a rich understanding of 
of the American political system and how it actually works, the American economy and how it actually works, those things would be very good to get at an educational background. So that can be improved. But I'll tell you right now, my pressing issue is, I mean, I want to educate journalists, but I want jobs for them. Because right now we're educating the next generation of unemployed waiters and waitresses. <laughs> Are you guys journalists up here in the front row? Prospective journalists? Do it. Don't take anything I said being that you shouldn't do journalism. Fight for it, claw for it, demand it. You get, being a journalist is like being an artist now, or a dancer, or an actor, or a filmmaker. You've got to go into it with that passion and don't settle for anything less. The next member of the audience described how she did a job shadow with a journalist from the Oregonian, Portland's only daily newspaper. That Oregonian reporter told this student that she would not have a chance to get a job as a journalist because she is white. Well, I think that's preposterous. That, that, that's preposterous. I mean, you don't have a chance to get a job because there's no jobs, but I... That's, but that, that's, that's, the reason, that's the real issue. That's We can change that, but that's preposterous. It really is. The next member of the audience referred back to earlier comments by the speaker that there needed to be more locally owned and locally focused radio stations. He asked if the speaker was suggesting that we scrap national radio stations like National Public Radio. No, because NPR is a network. It's a network that works over local stations. And your local NPR affiliate has an option to carry as much local NPR programming as it wants. What I'd love to see, though, if we, with my plan, is you could have a lot more variety in local stations. I mean, all these crazy music stations no one listens to that give you these canned formats that some advertising knucklehead comes up with. You know, let's get rid of those. We don't need those anymore. That, I'm perfectly happy to farm that one out to the trust fund kids on the internet and we can listen to what they want us to hear on our computers. Let's use radio for some more interesting local stuff. We don't need it for that stuff anymore. The next member of the audience observed that there are many publicly financed media systems throughout the world, such as the BBC in the United Kingdom, Radio Deutsche Welle in Germany, and even NPR here in the United States. And yet even with these publicly financed systems, we can see inscribed in their reporting the distribution of power that exists in the broader society. In the system that you're proposing today, what might work to immunize these media systems against these corrupting influences? Perfect. What a wonderful question. And I, I wish we had a society where that sort of question was a central issue we were talking about rather than the one that comes like after 49 other questions and you get to it. You know, I think that the way I think you best deal with that is by having a plurality of structures. So that's why you'll notice when I talked about giving money to public and community media, I said and community. So all the community stations which are unaffiliated with the NPR type system would also get a lot of resources to hire journalists in the same community. So you have different people competing. And I think, you know, ideally we have a nonprofit, non-commercial radio and television or media system that's not just NPR and PBS, they're a part of it, but it's also community stations and student stations I'm a big fan of, more voices uh, with resources to do work. And I think that's our healthiest way to deal with it. I mean, because there are political fights there. You're, but you're right, it's always going to reflect the political power structure in society. That's unavoidable. But that way, maybe it's going to be harder for the political power structure to have control over what gets seen. And that'll put pressure on those media to wise up when other people are breaking stories. You know, I mean, I think it's the best bet we can do it um, and have a free society. The next member of the audience, referring to the annual National Conference for Media Reform, asked where this year's conference would be. No conference. Um, thank you for that question. Free Press has had four mega conferences. Those are the Woodstocks for geeks. And uh, we're not going to have, we're going to have smaller sort of policy oriented ones. Go to freepress.net and you'll stay posted. Thank you for asking that. Well, thank you all very much. You've been listening to media scholar, historian, and founder of Free Press, Professor Robert McChesney. The title of the lecture is The Life or Death Struggle for Journalism and Self-Government. Robert McChesney also hosts a weekly radio program, Media Matters, available online as a podcast at will.illinois.edu slash media matters. And to find out more about the work of Free Press, the organization co-founded by Robert McChesney, 
please visit their website at www.freepress.net. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To access our growing library of on-demand streaming audio and video programs, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find programs featuring speakers such as Prothop Chatterjee, Barbara Ehrenreich, Diana Butu, Kevin Phillips, Susan Faludi, and many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic community media. Increased The amount of news that we need uh, has increased. Uh, it's a severe problem. Newspapers, daily newspapers are closing down. It's almost a daily occurrence to see something in the news now about our newspaper that's considering closing or cutting back. Uh, again, this is unprecedented in American history. We've never been in a situation with newspapers closing routinely uh, where we're going to have areas in our country with no working journalists covering them any longer. Uh, communities are voting on public office where there will be no political information upon which citizens will be able to vote. As bad as the closings are, as bad as the layoffs are of journalists uh, at newspapers that are closing, are just that those newspapers that are attempting to survive, those newsrooms that are attempting to survive, to do so are following the logic of cutting back, uh, reducing the number of workers they have, closing down bureaus, uh, so that what they have to offer is hardly attractive and shedding readers uh, who are for understandably saying, why should I pay money to read what exists in this newspaper? It's really sort of the funeral march or death dance of daily newspapers. Now, were this just an issue about daily newspapers that I was talking about, their decline and possible demise in the next year or two with the, uh, or, or severe retrenchment in the next year or two, that wouldn't be too severe of a crisis necessarily. Regrettably, though, we aren't just talking about daily newspapers, we're talking about the entirety of journalism as we know it in the United States. And let me just go through that. There was once a time, and anyone under the age of 40 will find this surprising news, that we had radio journalism in the United States on commercial radio that no longer exists. In the early 1970s, for example, if you were to go into a city like Washington, D.C., or any city of that size, any of the 20 largest cities in the United States, there probably would have been two dozen full-time working radio journalists just covering that community. That was standard issue. Just radio. So if the mayor did something, if there was some big breaking story, two dozen radio journalists would be over there covering it. Just in radio. Well, wipe them out. Get the eraser out. They're all gone. There's no more commercial newscasting to speak of in this country on radio. Television news. You know, local television news now, like you just say that, it's like a joke. People start laughing. You don't have to say anything more. Uh, in this country today, you know, we're such a diverse country, there's so much, you know, there's all the, there's people from so many different cultures and backgrounds, so many different interests. Uh, the one thing I found that unites all Americans, no matter where they're from, what their background is, everyone thinks their local TV news is the worst in the country. It's sort of our unifying thread nowadays in the United States. Uh, as for cable TV news, or broadcast news at the national level, there's very little journalism there too, it's mostly punditry. Uh, people pontificating, oftentimes pointlessly, uh, reinforcing the conventional wisdom and offering much heat, very little light. So there's not much journalism there too. And on television, when you do get journalism on it, it's usually when they bring a print journalist on to talk about some story the print journalist Thanks, Mick. Well, thank you very much, Mick, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And I want to thank you and Renee Heath and everyone else here at the University of Portland who brought me here. It's really a, a pleasure to be here.
uh, both at this university and in this city. And uh, tonight what I want to do, if it's okay, is give a talk that you will be the really the first people to hear. And you know, usually if you think you get someone gives a talk, they package up something they've been giving 75 times before. But we're in very unique times right now in the United States. Uh, the economic meltdown, uh, the depression, frankly, that we're in now, uh, looks to be the defining moment of all um, our lives. And I suspect for the students at the University of Portland, the period we're entering right now will pretty much define your lives, much like the Great Depression or World War II defined your great-grandparents or grandparents' lives or my parents' lives. Uh, that's the type of moment we're in. And in the middle of this crisis we're in, both political and economic, um, there's a crisis right now in journalism that's part of it that is every bit as important um, as the crisis of the economy. They go hand in hand, but they're distinct, and it's every bit as important. So what I want to do tonight is talk about that crisis, how to understand it, and what we can and must do uh, in the coming months and years uh, to address it and the peril we face if we do not, and the peril is severe. First of all, and I think many of you are familiar with this, we're in the midst right now of extraordinary uh, cutbacks in journalism, in traditional journalism as we know it. Uh, in the past year, roughly 16,000 journalists, paid journalists, working journalists in the United States with daily newspapers have lost their jobs. We're down to roughly 50,000 today. Uh, to 60,000, excuse me, and it's expected that we'll lose at least that many, if not more, this year. Um, the number of people who are paid to do journalism today in the United States, or by the end of this year, to even be more graphic, who are paid to do journalism by the end of this year in the United States will be a small fraction of the number 25 or 30 years ago. But our population as journalists is done and report on it and give some insight. So with newspapers go, there's not anything at radio or television to compensate or make it up. Newspapers are really the main game. And then there's, of course, the internet. And the internet, of course, is the future of all media. We know that. We're in that process now. But at present, there's no indication that at this point in time, the internet is poised to replace um, what we're losing and provide sufficient journalism. Uh, most of the stories that are linked to come from print originally. When those journalists stop collecting paychecks, those stories will stop being written, they'll stop being posted online. I love Wikipedia, I love the blogosphere. My wife thinks my head's been grafted onto a computer screen. Uh, but I have no illusions that that alone will not replace journalism. Uh, for social networking, for the internet to reach its promise of citizens' journalism, it has to work with a viable, strong journalism. We can't replace it. It has to have it as the basis for it to really help us improve and enhance uh, our political culture. And it's not doing it yet. The efforts of old media, of newspapers to move to the internet, have been a process of trading old media dollars for new media pennies. It simply hasn't cut it. And there's no reason to think it will in the foreseeable future. So we're entering, as I said, uncharted waters, dangerous waters. Literally, we could be down to just a handful of journalists uh, in community after community in large parts of the country with no working journalists whatsoever. Uh, huge state government with hardly any journalists covering it. Already we're down in most states where there used to be dozens of journalists covering the state house, just a handful are now covering it. Uh, with much more news going on, uh, nonetheless, you were journalists. It's a deeply troubling time, and really the only people who can benefit by this, frankly, are corrupt politicians and the interests they serve. They're the only ones who benefit by operating entirely in the dark. For the rest of us, it's an absolute nightmare. And I, I, I'll stop here. I could do an entire talk on just what the dimensions of the nightmare would be if we lose all journalism. Uh, but just trust me, it's bad news. If you, the more you think about it, the more depressing it becomes. Now, this is not an original statement I'm making. If you've been reading Time Magazine, The New Republic, The Los Angeles Times, uh, any of our major news media journals of opinion over the last three months, this is a recurring theme, writer after writer commenting upon the collapse of journalism, the decline of resources, the problems it causes. And there are two reasons that are generally given for why this is taking place today, two explanations. First is the internet. The internet is blamed because it's taken away advertising dollars from newspapers and it's taking away young people who would rather surf the web than buy a newspaper and read it. So the internet's bad guy number one. Bad guy number two is the depression uh, that has basically speared debt-laden media corporations and made it almost impossible for them to survive. So even 
newspaper firms that the operating expenses of their newspapers are still in the black or close to the black are paying such enormous amounts of debt that they're going to go under. They can't sustain the collapse of journalism today. Uh, not at all. The real cause, the real causes, going backward, you have to start with the corporate conglomerate control over the news, which began in earnest in the 1960s and 70s, especially in the 1970s. Uh, this had devastating implications as chain owners, corporate owners, uh, began then in the late 70s and throughout and ever since the cutbacks in bureaus, the cutbacks in journalists. That process began then, did not begin uh, five years ago or two years ago. In from the mid-1980s to today in the city of Philadelphia, for example, as a representative example, there are half as many working journalists in Philadelphia in 2005 as there were in 1987. The number was cut in half working paid journalists. That's just Philadelphia. That's true in every city in the country. Those sort of cutbacks have been going on. Uh, this process began long before the World Wide Web kicked in. It started long before the economic depression, obviously. The loss of young readers certainly began long before two or three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience with my students since the 1980s, you see every five years a drop off in the number of young readers. I mean, to the point where there's virtually no newspaper readers today uh, that, I, that I encounter under the age of 25, daily newspaper subscribers and readers. Uh, it simply doesn't exist. And the quality of newspapers has shrunk too. Uh, a friend of mine named Tom Frank, some of you might be familiar with, who wrote What's the Matter with Kansas and The Wrecking Crew more recently. I was interviewing him for my radio show a while back and he was talking about research he was doing on American newspapers and he said he had the privilege to go back and read a lot of daily newspapers from different cities around the country from the 1960s and he said it was extraordinary the difference between that and newspapers of the last 10 or 15 years. You actually had coverage of all sorts of issues, uh, all sorts of people who were showing up in the news like Ralph Nader and civil rights leaders. This, it, was, it was like a rich rainforest of information compared to the, the frozen tundra of American daily newspaper of more recent times. Uh, there's been a sharp uh, difference, uh, and this is really the, the cause, if you want to look for the cause of the crisis of journalism, start there. Uh, as an industry, the collapse of the advertising revenues for newspapers did not start in the last six months or year. Newspaper advertising revenues, as a percentage of all advertising, has been gradually decreasing from 1950 to 1990, losing money to TV, which was booming during that period and growing. But the real sharp accelerated decline began in 1990. Then advertising got 26% of all advertising dollars. Newspapers got 26% of all advertising dollars uh, in 1990. This year it's expected to have maybe 10%. The sharp drop started in 1990, long before the World Wide Web, and long before the economic depression. And finally on this point, as long ago as 20 years ago, there were already prominent editors and journalists from leading newspapers who were quitting the field uh, and writing books in protest to how corporate takeovers and corporate control have been semi-profitable operations. So between the internet and the depression, we're told, um, that accounts for the crisis. And with that sort of analysis, the solutions that we come up with and almost everything that's, that's out there now are sort of small-scale uh, premises that we can get philanthropists to throw money in, uh, maybe we can get all the foundations to kick in money to pay for journalism, or possibly we can get the internet. We'll finally figure out a way to make money doing journalism, and that, that will solve the problem that we face. In the meantime, until it's solved, we'll have no journalism, politicians will be in the dark, and citizens will be clueless. Um, I think that these solutions are entirely insufficient. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of all the innovations that are going on. I, if you can convince foundations to give some group of journalists money to do cover news in the community, more power to you. But the idea that this will be sufficient to give us the type of journalism we need for uh, self-government is preposterous. There's simply no evidence whatsoever the foundation community has those sort of resources. Uh, even anything close to it, that's simply not satisfactory. And even the journalists who are at the most uh, developed of these new models online, like the Min Post and the Twin Cities, are the first ones to acknowledge this is not the solution. This is not going to be satisfactory. We, we're part of a solution, but we have to go far beyond this if we're actually going to cover the events of the day and, and do it as journalists need to do. So this is what I want to talk about, is maybe a better way, in my view, to understand the crisis of journalism that goes a little deeper and a little more historical. And if we do that, maybe we can come up with stronger solutions that'll get us not just back to where we were, because that's not good enough, 
but get us way ahead of where we were, where we need to be if we're going to have a genuine democracy in the United States. And I should preface this also by saying one other thing. What I'm going to talk about in terms of suggestions tonight before I'm done are things that if I'd said in a talk a year ago would have been grounds to declare me clinically insane. They're going to be extraordinarily radical. But understand, a year ago, if I stood up and said that George W. Bush would engage in policies that would make nationalizing the banking system eminently rational, you would have thought I too would be clinically insane. We are in historically uncharted times. The old system is collapsing, it's disintegrating. There's no status quo to be conservative about. The choice is what sort of future we're going to have, both for our economy, our politics, and especially for our media. Uh, so understand, that's the context of this talk, that we're in a truly uh, unusual, rare time, the time, that, sort of time history that comes across once in a century. Uh, we're fortunate or unfortunate, depending on what happens, that it's on our beat. So how do we understand this crisis better? How do we understand the crisis of journalism? First of all, the internet and the economic depression aggravate the problem, they accentuate the problem, they accelerate the problem. They're not the cause of the crisis of journalism. The